Welcome to The Bitter Witness. Don't be scared. (laughs) Hello, welcome back. I'm Rebecca and I'm your host for The Bitter Witness. I hope you have had a wonderful week. Here in my part of Ontario, Canada, the snow is almost gone, which is unheard of at this time of year. We've even reached plus six Celsius just yesterday. I could have gotten a suntan, it was so beautiful out there. This week, we are going to be discussing a missing persons case from Ontario. So, trigger warning, this episode will include discussion of disappearance, domestic violence, and possible murder. Both the dogs are sleeping behind me. Piper is running in her sleep and has a big smile on her face. Must be having a great dream. So grab a cup of tea, sit back and relax while I tell you the case of Cheryl Shepard. As usual, I want to give the victims in this case top billing. Cheryl, Odette, I acknowledge you and I send my love to you, wherever you may be. To begin, I need to acknowledge the dogged groundwork that has been done in this case by David Rigdon, host of Someone Knows Something, a CBC podcast, He has a wonderful series on this case, and much of the information that I used for today's episode came from him. I feel it is imperative in cases like this to retell and retell the stories and share any and all information that has come to light. I, like David, believe that there is someone somewhere that knows what happened to Cheryl, and I hope that by putting this story out there, that person or persons will decide that it is finally time to come forward and help us locate Cheryl not only to give themselves some peace, but also to give some peace to Cheryl's mother, Odette, and the rest of her family. I wholeheartedly believe that this case is solvable and that justice and peace can be found. Cheryl Shepard was 29 years old when she went missing from Hamilton, Ontario in 1998. Cheryl is the youngest daughter of Odette Fisher. When Cheryl was younger, her and her older sister Sheila attended brownies together, and according to Odette, she and her two girls did a lot together, day trips and the like, whatever the single mother could afford. Odette states that Cheryl was very pretty and that people used to turn their heads to look at her. Cheryl was blonde with blue eyes and stood five foot four, weighing 102 pounds at the time of her disappearance. Police believe that sometime on January 2, 1998, Cheryl Shepard went missing. The case remains unsolved to this day. There is a $50,000 reward available in this case. However, no new information leading to Cheryl's whereabouts has come forward as of yet. As I said earlier, David Rigdon has done an amazing series on Someone Knows Something. I don't want to replicate David's series on the disappearance of Cheryl Shepard. Instead, I would like to focus on the timeline and the dates surrounding Cheryl's disappearance. The first few items in our timeline are earlier than when Cheryl disappeared. We're going to start in August of 1992. Cheryl marries Keith Dale. Keith is also known as Keeper. The marriage lasts only a few months and the couple divorces. Odette, Cheryl's mother, states that Keith Dale broke Cheryl's arm and that he was very abusive during their marriage. Sometime in the mid-90s, Cheryl marries David Brian Sweeney, who goes by Brian. In July of 1996, Cheryl was charged and convicted with possession of stolen property under $5,000. She was sentenced to 18 months probation and community service. May 14th, 1997, Cheryl and Brian's divorce becomes final. On December 31st, 1997, Cheryl attends a New Year's Eve party at the Hamilton Convention Center. The entire event is broadcast on the ONTV network, a provincial channel. Cheryl attended the party with her then-boyfriend, Michael Lavoie. During the night, Michael was able to propose to Cheryl live on air. Cheryl said yes, and the crowd around them celebrated. According to the television hosts of the evening, a love connection was made. There is a video available on the internet of this proposal. 
On January 1st, 1998, Cheryl calls her mother Odette from the apartment that they share on Queenston Road in Hamilton. Cheryl is asking Odette what time she thinks her train will get into Union Station in Toronto. Odette has been out east in New Brunswick visiting family and friends for the holiday. Odette informs Cheryl that her train will get into Union Station in Toronto on Sunday, January 4th. Then, on the phone call, Cheryl speaks with her grandmother and her aunt. When the phone came back to Odette, Cheryl told her mother that she would be at Union Station to pick her up when the train got in. However, Cheryl does not mention to her mother on this phone call that she has accepted Lavoie's proposal the night before. Also on January 1st, Cheryl receives a call from her boss, Sammy, at Tim Hortons. He calls and fires Cheryl because she hasn't shown up for work. However, we are not sure if Sammy left this as a message or if he actually spoke to Cheryl. On January 2nd, 1998, an employee at the bingo hall across the street from Cheryl and Odette's apartment identified Lavoie and Cheryl as being at the bingo hall between 9 a.m. and 12.30 p.m. Lavoie leaves a message on the answering machine for Cheryl at 4.40 p.m. However, we are not told by the police what is on that message. Michael Lavoie states that he drove Cheryl to the Concord Club in Niagara Falls that evening. Lavoie states that Cheryl wanted to go to the Concord Club in Niagara Falls because she wanted to start exotic dancing again. Lavoie states that he dropped Cheryl off in the alley behind the club and drove away. He states that the time of the drop-off was between 6.45 and 7 p.m. Lavoie states that he couldn't stay and watch Cheryl enter the club because he had to pick up his three daughters. Between 7 and 7.30, Lavoie attends the home of his ex-wife, Gwen, and picks up his three daughters. He tells his ex-wife that he has proposed to Cheryl and she has accepted. When asked where Cheryl is by his ex-wife, Gwen, he tells her that Cheryl is working. Once Lavoie has picked up his children, he takes them back to his mother's house. There, he asks his mother if she will watch the girls for the night. Lavoie's mother asks him where Cheryl is. He tells his mother Cheryl is home sleeping. January 4th, 1998, Odette arrives at Union Station in Toronto, but Cheryl never shows to pick her up. Odette finds her own way home. When she arrives at the apartment, she notices that one of Lavoie's hockey bags is missing and she assumes that he is at a hockey game. Odette states that both Cheryl's glasses and her contacts were in her room. Odette stated that Cheryl actually couldn't see at all without her glasses or contacts. As well, Cheryl's wallet was found in the pocket of one of her coats inside her closet. And inside Cheryl's wallet was her credit card and her license. As well, Cheryl's car was in the parking lot of the apartment building. At 7 p.m., Lavoie returns his three daughters to their mother, Gwen, in Chippewa. Gwen stated that her oldest daughter informed her that they hadn't seen Cheryl all weekend and that she was missing. At 10 p.m., Lavoie returns to Odette and Cheryl's apartment. According to Odette, Lavoie entered the apartment and set Cheryl's set of keys on the counter. Odette stated that she asked Lavoie where Cheryl is. Lavoie answers, I haven't seen her since Friday. Lavoie informs Odette that he dropped Cheryl off between 6.45 and 7 behind the Concord Club in Niagara Falls. When Odette inquires to Lavoie why Cheryl would want to be dropped off at a club in Niagara Falls, Lavoie informs Odette that Cheryl wanted to dance at the club for the weekend to make some money. 
Odette is suspicious of this because Cheryl has a full-time job at Tim Hortons, as far as she knows. Cheryl had done exotic dancing professionally for about a year, but had stopped earlier. Cheryl had told her mother that she was done exotic dancing. After questioning Lavoie about where Cheryl is, Odette decides to contact the police. The police tell Odette that she should wait until the next day, in case Cheryl comes home, and that the couple may have had an argument and she might just be out cooling down. Odette states that after the phone call with the police, she went to bed, but she heard Lavoie shuffling papers in his and Cheryl's bedroom, then watching some TV, and then she thinks he left the apartment. January 5th, 1998. Odette got up and went to work at 5.30 a.m. However, when she got to work, her co-workers realized how upset she was and asked her what was happening. She told them her daughter was missing, and they told her to go home. When Odette returned to the apartment, she ran into Lavoie, who was just exiting it. Lavoie stated that he was going to have coffee with his mother. Odette called the police and reported Cheryl as missing. Odette was told that she had to go to the Stony Creek Police Department, which was the area that their apartment was located in. Odette went to the police station. However, when she got there, she was told that they didn't have the correct paperwork to fill out a missing persons report. The police then called the Central Division and handed the phone to Odette. While Odette was at the police station, Lavoie went back to the apartment and removed all of his belongings. Later that afternoon, Lavoie was in Chippewa. He found his ex-wife Gwen out for a walk and asked her to get in the car. He told Gwen that he and Cheryl had had a fight and that they still hadn't found her. He also told Gwen that Cheryl had been fired from her job at Tim Hortons. As well, he now tells Gwen that when he picked up the girls, Cheryl was sleeping, not at work, as he had stated before. After their conversation inside Lavoie's car, he drove Gwen home, got out of the car, went onto the porch of Gwen's house, kissed his daughters, and handed Gwen $100 and told her it was for the girls. Gwen stated that he started crying and remained heavily crying as he drove away. Gwen also stated that Lavoie never previously gave her money for the girls, ever. January 6th, 1998. Lavoie's car is checked by a security guard in the Casino Rama parking lot at 5.30 a.m., and police confirmed that he was inside gambling until at least 11.30 a.m. After 11.30, the woman who married Cheryl's ex-husband, Keeper, named Betty, is headed to the police station for her interview concerning Cheryl's disappearance, and she ran into Lavoie at a bank, updating his bank book. Lavoie is also supposed to meet with Hamilton police to discuss Cheryl's disappearance this day. Instead, he rents a storage locker. Pat, Lavoie's mother, receives a call from Lavoie. He states in the call that he loves her and that he's going away for a while. Later in the day, Lavoie heads back to Chippewa to Gwen's house. This time, he is delivering all of his daughter's toys that were at Cheryl and Odette's apartment. January 7, 1998. At 1.20 a.m., Lavoie is found inside a storage locker, inside Cheryl's white 1986 Buick Regal, overtaken by carbon monoxide. Lavoie was lying in the back seat of the car and had vomited on himself, which is a sign, according to the police, that he was very close to death. When police found Lavoie inside that storage locker, they opened the trunk of Cheryl's car, hoping that Cheryl might be inside, but she wasn't. There was no suicide note found, but there was a pad of paper found with Lavoie, 
The police could see that something had been written on the page that was missing as there were indents on the top piece. Lavoie didn't die. They found him within seconds of death. Lavoie was rushed to a hospital and they were able to save him. The hospital said that his blood was 45% carbon monoxide, 50% is lethal. That day, while Lavoie was in the hospital recovering, the police were able to obtain a search warrant for his clothing. However, when the police arrived at the hospital, Lavoie had checked himself out. February 25, 1998, Odette is out driving with a reporter from the Hamilton Spectator, Dan Nolan. They had just searched a construction site with large drainage pipes for Cheryl, but found nothing. They see Lavoie and pull up beside him. Odette says, tell us where Cheryl is, and Lavoie answers, obviously I'm not going to answer that. Then Lavoie tells Odette that he wants his personal things that are still in her apartment. Lavoie then lists off a bunch of things, jeans and socks and the like, and then he says, you give me back my stuff and I'll cooperate. Lavoie is driving Cheryl's car, and Odette states, that's Cheryl's car, to which Lavoie answers, no, this is my car. He then called Odette a liar and drove away. May 1998, Lavoie attends a baseball game at Skydome with his stepbrother and stepfather. His stepbrother Mark asks Lavoie straight out, did you do it? According to Mark, Lavoie gave him a look like, oh yeah, I did. At least, that's how Mark interpreted the look. That is the timeline that is known for the disappearance of Cheryl Shepard. Now let's discuss some key points in the case. The notepad. The notepad that was found with Lavoie inside Cheryl's car inside the storage locker during his suicide attempt was sent to a lab to be tested to try and find out what was written on the top page. The police believe that the following statements were printed on the top page that had been removed from the notepad. I went to see a movie, Jackie Brown. It was all right. I am at Cheers now, betting ponies. Not doing well. My wings just showed Hungry. Well, I won a couple. I'm about even now. Well, time to go. I love you. Please keep in. The next word is indiscernible. With kids. So you know, you know. Well, time to go. I love you. To me, this sounds like he was writing a suicide note. And because the top page is missing, he has either sent it to the person he wrote it to, or he has thrown it away. Either way, the note doesn't give an admission of guilt, does it? The current police detective that is in charge of Cheryl's case stated to David Rigdon that to date, and this was in 2023, Lavoie has spoken with the police perhaps a total of 30 minutes about this case. With information like that, I have to ask myself, why? Why is he not speaking with the police? If he is afraid that he will be framed for something he didn't do, have your lawyer sit in on the meeting. Your lawyer, if he's any good, will stop you before you incriminate yourself. My other reasoning, of course, is quite obvious. He doesn't speak to the police because he's guilty and he knows where Cheryl is. There are several pieces of information that David Rigdon follows in his podcast. However, I'm not going to get into them here. My purpose is to give awareness to Cheryl's disappearance and perhaps, hopefully, spark a small iota of conscience in the person or persons who do know what happened to Cheryl and do know where Lavoie was between January 2nd and January 4th. Those two days are the two days that aren't accounted for. No one seems to know where Lavoie was 
Why did he try to commit suicide two days after Cheryl was reported missing? Was it because he was so distraught over losing the woman he had just proposed to? Or was it because he had a guilty conscience? He knew that something bad had happened to Cheryl. He knew that he was responsible for that, and he couldn't live with the guilt. However, in the last episode of Rigdon's podcast, he finds Michael Lavoie still living in Hamilton. When he approaches Lavoie, Lavoie simply tells him, get the fuck off my property. For someone who was apparently so distraught over Cheryl's disappearance, he seems to have gone on and lived his life just fine. Lavoie still, to this day, refuses to speak with anyone regarding Cheryl's disappearance. As it stands now, the last time that Cheryl was seen alive was on January 2nd, 1998, at the bingo hall, with Lavoie. Lavoie admits that he dropped Cheryl off in Niagara Falls. However, there is much speculation about that statement. After canvassing all the bars in Niagara Falls, the police were not able to find one single person that saw Cheryl at the Concord or in Niagara Falls on January 2nd. The owner of the Concord Club stated that Cheryl never danced there. So where did Lavoie take Cheryl that night? My guess is wherever he took her, is where she is to this day. The police have not closed the case on Cheryl Shepard, and they won't close it until they find her and bring her home. Odette is not getting any younger. She's in her 70s now, and all this woman wants is to know where her daughter is. She wants to lay her daughter to rest. Cheryl's friends and acquaintances and co-workers have not forgotten Cheryl as we can see from the 10-part series that David Rigdon produced. The public has not forgotten Cheryl. There are still active Facebook pages pleading to help find her. I believe that with Lavoie's narcissism and arrogance, he has told somebody something, and that person is living with the guilt. I hope that having that knowledge of what happened to Cheryl is eating you up inside. And I hope that after hearing this or seeing another Facebook post of the yearly anniversary of Cheryl's disappearance, you finally, finally grow a spine and tell the police what they need to know to find Cheryl. If you have any information regarding Cheryl Shepard's disappearance, please contact the Hamilton police. There is a $50,000 reward being offered for the location of Cheryl Shepard. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please be safe out there and enjoy your day today. This has been a Bitter Witness production. 